Good evening, everyone, and welcome um, to the second night of the Strom, uh, annual Strom Lectures and at the University of Washington featuring Professor Lila Corwin Berman. My name is Susan Glenn, and I'm a professor of history uh, and hold the Sammy and Austria Strom Chair in Jewish Studies. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Washington sits on the occupied homelands of Coast Salish peoples whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. And we're grateful to live and work on these lands. Let me also take a moment to thank our amazing uh, Strom Center staff who've worked so hard all year to put this event together. Dr. Sarah Zaides Rosen, Grace Elizabeth D, Kara Schoemaker, and thank you all for the hard work you put into this event. I'm really thrilled and delighted uh, to introduce our speaker uh, tonight, Lila Corwin Berman, who's professor of history at Temple University, where she holds the Murray Friedman Chair in American Jewish History and directs the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History. She's also the chair of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. She's authored many, many articles and essays. <laughs> we have an intrusive bell in here. Um, uh, about Jewish life in the United States uh, and three path-breaking important books that situate Jews within the landscape of liberal politics in the United States. Uh, and the first of her books is called Speaking of Jews, Rabbis, Intellectuals, and the Creation of an American uh, Public Identity. And it explores how Jewish leaders, how rabbis and intellectuals, deployed the language of sociology and created sociological concepts of Jewishness to explain Jews to non-Jewish audiences uh, and to equate Jewish values uh, with post-war American principles. Her second book, Metropolitan Jews, Politics, Race, and, and Religion in Postwar Detroit, looks at the contradictions of urban liberalism and the aftermath of World War II, showing how even as Jews fled to the suburbs when uh, ethnic neighborhoods were confronted with racial integration, they remained deeply entangled in the urban heart of Detroit. Let me mention her most recent book, which is just a tour de force. Um, I told Lila that my husband, who's also a historian, are, and I are fighting over the book, and it keeps disappearing from my study, but okay. Anyway, for good reason. It's called The American Jewish Philanthropic Complex, A History of a Multi-Billion Dollar Institution. It's published in 2020 by Princeton University Press. This is really a taboo-breaking study, a taboo-breaking study that provides the first comprehensive history of American Jewish philanthropy uh, uh, and its effect on democracy and capitalism. One reviewer puts it aptly uh, when they write that the book has far-reaching implications and raises urgent questions that extend well beyond the world of American Jewish philanthropy itself, offering a deep dive into how philanthropy in general developed in tandem with the, United St with the US state. Professor Berman's Strom lectures focus on another taboo subject in American Jewish history, the question of whether Jews were automatically granted full citizenship rights. And in Tuesday's lecture, she challenged the idea that the United States never had a Jewish question, that it was an exceptional landscape, never had a question about whether Jews could be fully incorporated into the body politic. In tonight's lecture, which is titled Belonging in Question, Jews in the American Civic and Legal Imagination, will delve further into what she calls conditional citizenship, the conditional citizenship of American Jews by exploring the tensions between liberalism's elevation of the rights of individual citizens and the civic status of American Jews, the civil status of American Jews as a self-defined but also historically maligned ethno-religious group. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Lila Corbin Berman. And I will, un I will unhook myself. <laughs> 
seamless. That's one. Is that all right? And is it good? <laughs> okay. Um, I could get used to being introduced every other night. So I will call someone on, what is it, Thursday, on Saturday, and ask for, it's just um, so lovely and so meaningful to be here and to have, um, you know, introductions from two of my colleagues who I just respect the most, whose work is so important, um, and, and who have just, um, you know, really defined for me what it means to do good and important scholarship. So thank you, thank you, Noam, and thank you, Susan, and thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's, it's really my, my honor to be here um, delivering these lectures. And um, some of you who were here on Tuesday evening now have had um, some time to cogitate. And I think I should admit I'm a little nervous. You've probably come up with lots of, you know, even harder hitting questions for me. And I also sort of promised to deliver answers to all the questions I didn't quite know how to answer last time, I said, well, wait for tonight's lecture. So there was kind of a lot riding on this, and, and we'll, see, we'll see how it all goes. But for those of you uh, who, who were here on Tuesday, I'll do like that little recap, right? Very briefly, we talked about America's Jewish question, and I put forward to you the proposition that when it comes to formal citizenship, I suggested that instead of eschewing the possibility of a Jewish question in the United States, we should think about approaching it with the possibility of some curiosity, right? That the kind of foundational understanding that the United States never had a Jewish question has perhaps foreclosed important historical analysis, has foreclosed important historical research. And I focused on formal citizenship to raise some critical questions about that kind of regnant narrative, that emancipation solved the Jewish question in the United States once and for all, that citizenship was something that kind of came as um, you know, an automatic point that Jews arrived to when they came to the United States, and the question was never raised again. Um, and in talking about formal citizenship, I raised the problematic of what I called a liberal paradox of citizenship that citizenship's predicated on the idea of the neutral and the unmarked liberal individual, and yet threaded through with categorical and collective prerequisites of legal belonging. So that was the framing for the first lecture. And for tonight, I'm going to shift our lens from thinking about formal citizenship to thinking about what we might call effective citizenship. Um, or another way of thinking about it is the gap between formal citizenship and national belonging. And there's a, a legal historian, Barbara Welk, or Welke, I, I actually don't know how she says her last name, um, and she is, is the one who writes about effective citizenship in a way that I think is really important and opens up a second dimension that I want to talk about tonight when it comes to thinking about America's Jewish question. She writes that one might formally be a citizen and even enjoy particular rights and share obligations associated with citizenship and yet not enjoy effective citizenship because one is not invested in law with full personhood. In its dismissal of America's Jewish question, my field has tended to assume full personhood like formal citizenship as exceptionally realized for American Jews. And I think the clearest illustration of this, of how my field has, has um, presumed that alongside formal citizenship rights, Jews also gained effective citizenship, full personhood. An illustration of this is certainly quite clear when you look at how the field of American Jewish history has studied, or perhaps really not studied, um, the question of anti-Semitism in the United States, and has, in, in a sense, dismissed um, the kind of significance of, of anti-Semitism in this country by ca characterizing it as merely social or private in distinction to the real political and legal exclusions in Europe. And the historian who was really credited with drawing this distinction and saying that, yes, it may be the case that Jews in the United States experience certain elements of exclusion, but that that exclusion was never woven into the legal or political structure of the United States. 
is a mid 20th century historian named John Hyam who wrote about nativism and who wrote about immigration. Um, and then in a couple of articles addressed specifically anti-Semitism. And he wrote that social discrimination, the kind of anti-Semitism that affected American Jewry most closely owed very little to ideological sources, right? The idea that the kind of full personhood that Jews could realize was so exceptional in the United States because whatever anti-Semitism may have existed in this country was on the level of sort of individual slights, private kinds of matters, was called a kind of social problem and was not a legal or political one. And this thesis, which I think is kind of a, a very clear illustration of the way that my field has tended not only to minimize the idea of a Jewish question, but to minimize any kind of jagged edges around the idea of full personhood. This thesis has been really controlling of how the field of American Jewish history has talked about anti-Semitism. Um, and it's you know, gone through any kind of text that you can find after Chaim wrote about anti-Semitism, cites him and cites his thesis that anti-Semitism, like other forms of nativism in the United States, is essentially anomalous. And it's something that comes about at times of social tension. And it's really quite removed from anything having to do with the kind of political or legal nature of the United States. So for example, um, when Jonathan Sarna, an important American Jewish historian, responded to the Pittsburgh shooting, he repeated many of these kinds of theses and also repeated um, linking to this idea of anti-Semitism, those basic claims that I talked about on Tuesday that come out of the foundational idea that there's no American Jewish question, which is of America's exceptionalism, about the incredibly progress-driven narrative of American Jewish life, and about the idea of a kind of, um, if not perfect, ever-evolving toward perfection synthesis of American and Jewish life. Um, the idea that at root, the liberal ideal worked to grant Jewish full personhood and that there was no Jewish question about Jews' formal or effective citizenship has so grounded not only um, the broad inquiries of the field, but very specifically the way that Jewish exclusion and anti-Semitism has been written about. So the experiences that Jews had from within citizenship, not only from the edges of citizenship, help us understand, I think, what might be fruitful about actually imagining that there could be a Jewish question in the United States. And tonight, I want to explore what I think are two of the most important frameworks in American political life that promised to incorporate Jews into full and effective personhood. And I want to ask whether each of these, in fact, resolved the Jewish question, or perhaps they re-upped it. Um, and I'm going to talk tonight about religion, about the idea of the Judeo-Christian, and I'm going to talk today about race, about the idea of whiteness. And each of these offered a logic, and I think there's a parallel logic that they each offered, and I think you can only think this through by asking some of these um, questions about a Jewish question. They offered a logic to turn Jews into the unmarked, into the neutral, in a kind of process of incorporation or overcoming or possibly colonizing, right? A kind of discourse, a framework that could incorporate, overcome, bring Jews in. But each also sustained a kind of persistent mechanism to exclude. So in, in, in other words, these discourses participated in that liberal paradox, right? Of offering a certain kind of belonging predicated on the ability of the individual or the group to enter into a kind of unmarked neutral framework while always holding on the other side that possibility for exclusion, those special reasons for exclusion. Um, and, and I'm going to, to suggest that the certainty that America had no Jewish question has really limited our ability to understand the actual operation of these two very, very significant frameworks when it comes to understanding American Jewish history and when it comes to understanding American history more broadly. So we're gonna start by talking about religion um, and thinking very broadly about the project of liberal enlightenment and how liberal enlightenment 
regarded religion, right? And one of the kind of amazing radical uh, propositions of the Enlightenment was that there could be something called the secular, right? That there could be a realm in which even as religion existed and mattered in certain things, that there could be a realm that was not controlled by the idea of religion. And that in, in the European context, this meant narrowing, in a certain sense, the terrain of Christianity. But at the same time, historians who write about enlightenment ideas of Christianity and enlightenment ideas of religion discuss the way in which, instead of Christianity necessarily being pulled out of every element of civic or, or legal or political life, in many ways it was normalized into it, right? Um, it became a way of defining the civic, became a way of defining the secular. Anything that was defined as religion or secular was in a certain sense regarded in a certain framework defined by Christianity. And thus it became a kind of neutral norm. Um, it, it made it hard to see, and it became a sort of um, kind of structuring force that was unmarked in, in certain ways. And this dynamic of narrowing Christianity, yet infusing the secular with it, has been really essential to many renderings of the Jewish question, right? Um, you know, in, in earlier times when there was not this sort of notion that you could have a separate political or legal structure from religion, the, the challenge of Judaism or of Jews living in a political system openly defined as being Christian had a very obvious nature to it. When, when there is a, a sort of proposition that you have a civic or a secular that's not defined by Christian, and yet it's been kind of normalized and naturalized into that, the nature of asking who actually can belong to it shifts. And part of the kind of European Jewish question had to do with that tension, that there were still these norms or these naturalized ways in which the Christian framework was imagined to be the, the norm. And yet there was you know, a kind of possibility that others could be part of it. So there's this kind of narrowing and yet diffusion of Christianity. Well, in the United States, for most of its history, American polit political leaders presupposed a Protestant foundation to the nation, um, even when they narrowed the explicit sway of Christianity. So we can see this dynamic in the United States. So for example, if we think about the First Amendment, Right, which is often used to illustrate you know, just how radical the founders were. And often people presume, right, they were absolutely trying to sort of extract Christianity from American political and legal life. But actually in the context of the First Amendment, what the founders were doing um, was saying there was not one particular Christian denomination that was going to be able to hold sway over the country. And that was fairly radical. But in most of their imaginations, it wasn't the fact that religion itself or Christianity itself would have nothing to do with the, the Republic. There was not an issue of that in the least. The notion was absolutely that Christianity was foundation, foundational to it. And this is obvious also in invocations of common law, right? So if you look at American jurisprudence, um, you know, certainly for the first century of, of this country, there's often recourse to ideas of common law common law connected to British law, also completely grounded in a Christological, in a Christian framework. So the, the Protestant was the center in this country from which others would be granted toleration, right? And there's a scholar named uh, Tisa Wenger who writes about something that she calls religious freedom talk. And she describes the rise in the late 19th century of religious freedom talk as a kind of regulating mode, right? If you think about what toleration is, how toleration works, it often does operate from a certain center that there are the things that don't need to be tolerated because they are the assumed norm. And then there are things around it that then need to be designated as tolerable or intolerable. And she talks about religious freedom talk as um, a kind of regulating mode in that, that grew in the late 19th century to regulate um, and naturalize who or what should be tolerated under the rubric of what was religion, right? So if it wasn't just Protestantism, what was it? What did this category mean? And what, what kinds of freedoms did religion or different religions need to be granted so they could be tolerated?
And in the early 20th century, uh, religious freedom talk really resolves into the language of Judeo-Christian. And it's a kind of melding of Protestant assumptions about what counted as religion. And there's a lot of really excellent scholarship about the kind of Protestant ideal of what religion is, marking itself on all sorts of other non-Protestant religious categories and sort of Protestantizing, if that's a word, uh, all of those different kinds of categories. So the Judeo-Christian melding Protestant assumptions of what counted as religion with a kind of philosophical idea of pluralism, of multiplicity. Um, and this generalized religion into a kind of both, a, 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 on one hand, there's a narrowing of kind of the, the Protestant sway or the, the, even the Christian sway. And at the same time, there's a diffusion in this kind of um, Judeo-Christian moment in this religious freedom talk. Um, and it generalized religion into what Robert Bella, who's a very important um, 20th century sociologist, would call a civil religion that in his estimation shared much in common with Christianity. So even from within the Judeo-Christian moment, and there are lots of fabulous historians who've written about this Judeo-Christian ideal and the kind of regulating force and the disciplining force and the inclusionary force of it. Um, but from this Judeo-Christian moment, I think we actually can really see how the Jewish question reemerged as a question that was really indexed by Christian norms, right? It was defined by Christian norms, and that was, you know, a, a very kind of key characteristic of the Jewish question in European context as well, was what, what is kind of seen as the norm and what is the Jewish question sort of being asked against or indexed by. Um, and it's abundantly clear that this happens when you look at lots of different cases that have to do with how American law is thinking about the role of Jews, the role of their Judaism, and the kinds of protections or exclusions that can be tolerated. So I want to turn my attention to um, one particular case that I think really is going to help illustrate how important this sort of idea of Christianity functioning as a kind of neutral, a kind of unmarked norm against which, against with, which Jews and their Judaism was always sort of being arrayed and arranged, tolerated, included, excluded. Um, and the, the case that I'm going to talk about is a case that has to do with something called Sunday laws. And probably some of you have heard of what a Sunday law is. And it's a case that starts in May of 1954. Um, and this is at, you know, right at this moment when historians who study the idea of the Judeo-Christian talk about the, the kind of expansion of this idea that the United States is not just a Christian country, it is a Judeo-Christian country, and that lots of different political figures, right? You have Eisenhower saying, um, every American has to be a religion, I don't care which one it is, right? So this sort of idea of religion being a generalized good and being able to exist in multiple formats, and yet that being in tension with the assumption that there is a kind of normativity to Christian America. So in May of, 1940, of 1954, a man named Harold Chernock was arrested for violating Massachusetts' observance of the Lord's Day Law. And he was arrested because he was operating a kosher supermarket and it, was a, it had sold meat, it was a butcher shop, and sold other kosher products for operating this kosher supermarket in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and I feel a special connection to this case and to this store. Both of my parents are from the Springfield area. And when I saw, I kind of stumbled upon this case and I was super excited because I know what Crown is and I know my grandmother um, who passed away in the last few years would talk about Crown and I was even able to ask her a few questions about this case. So this guy's arrested. Let me back up and tell you a little bit about Sunday Laws and then we're gonna get back to the case. So Sunday Laws existed in most American states, really from their establishment. And they banned commercial and leisure activities on Sundays, on, on the Christian Sabbath. And they were unequivocally grounded in a Christian logic. Um, and they were generally understood to be about maintaining the kind of sanctity of the Christian Sabbath. So a case, there is a case in Maryland in 
1834 when uh, a Jewish store had been kept open and they were, they were uh, prosecuted under the Sunday laws. And when the judge was dealing with the case, he said, ours is a Christian community and a day set apart as a day of rest is the day consecrated by the resurrection of our savior, right? Just very, very clear that Sunday was the day because this was the Lord's day and, and that this was a day that was meant to be free of lots of different leisure activities and commercial activities. Um, and occasionally Jews would enter petitions against these kinds of laws and that would give justices a chance to sort of restate why these laws were in fact legitimate. So on one count, Jews would sometimes say this was an infringement of their economic rights because they were not operating stores on Saturday in observance of their Sabbath, and then they couldn't operate their stores on Sunday. So unlike non-Jews who only had one day when they couldn't be engaged in commercial activity, Jews had two days, and that infringed on their economic rights. Um, and sometimes they would argue it was an infringement of constitutional rights, though it depended on what state right, because prior to the passage of the 14th Amendment, there was no sense that the First Amendment in the federal constitution necessarily applied to the citizens of any particular state, unless there was sort of interstate commerce or connections going on. So sometimes they would say that this was favoring one religion over the other and that that was unconstitutional. And in both cases, judges tended to say that these laws were completely legitimate because this was the Christian Sabbath and America was a Christian country. So over and over throughout the 19th century, um, this is rehearsed. But by the late 19th century, there starts to be a new kind of defense of these Sunday laws. And that has to do with defending the laws as civil, right? As something done for the public welfare. So that they're not necessarily because the Lord our Savior, um, you know, designated this as the day to rest, but because there needed to be a day for the public good that people didn't have to work. This is it, you know, the, an idea about labor, right? And that this was the day that, that made sense. So for example, this judge in, uh, in a New York State case in 1861 explained that the Christian Sabbath had simply become a civil and a political institution. And the same can't be said about the Jewish Sabbath. And this is such a, a kind of clear illustration of the way in which Christianity becomes that which is unmarked, right? Shuttling it from, you know, saying clearly Christian words about the Lord and resurrection and the Savior and whatever else to saying, look, this is just a civil institution and you need a day of rest and this is a day and it's for the, the good of the public. The idea of a civil regulation denuded Christianity of its specificity while asserting it as a kind of general principle of American civic life. Um, by the early 20th century, there are clear indications of laws, Sunday laws, that in fact are used as tools to explicitly regulate Jewish activities. So in 1901, New York State passes a law to prohibit the sale of, quote, uncooked flesh foods or meats, fresh or salted, um, and to prohibit the sale on Sundays. Right? So very, very clearly designating that kosher butchers cannot be open. And the reason that this law was passed is because it was a lobbying campaign by non-kosher butchers who wanted to take Sunday off, who believed they should take Sunday off, but were fearful that they would lose customers to kosher butchers. And that you know, as there were new immigrants and there were different people who would go shopping on Sunday and there was a kind of opening up of expansion activity on uh, economic activity on Sundays, they were concerned that if they weren't open, they were going to be losing market share to kosher butchers. And in fact, it was so clear that this was what was at the heart of this legislation that a state legislator frankly said, this was class legislation of the most pernicious kind. Um, it, was, it was very clear that in this case, it was being designated against kosher butchers um, and trying to curtail their activities on Sundays because of an economic reason. And Jewish leaders at the time who knew this was happening, who understood what, what was going on in the campaign to pass this law, um, nonetheless backed away from legal challenges. And in fact, what's really interesting is there were kind of more legal challenges to Sunday laws in the mid 19th century than there were in the late 19th and the beginning of the 20th. And there was like increasingly this sense 
um, that these laws were best to be dealt with in quiet ways. So for example, trying to get certain exemptions to the Sunday laws. Some Jewish leaders said this might be yet another reason to change the Jewish Sabbath to Sunday, which is something that, that happened in certain congregations um, in the United States. And they deemed these to be social problems. And it is, if you recall that historiography about anti-Semitism, right, that by the mid-1950s is saying anti-Semitism is a social problem, you can actually see the kind of stirrings of that in a sort of apologetic discourse that these Jewish leaders at the time don't want to make a kind of Jewish issue of this. And so these are laws, I think you could have called these legal problems, but they're designating these to be social problems. But by the mid 20th century, there's mounting energy to start to challenge these laws. And some of it is a kind of changing economic climate, pressures for retailers to meet the demands for weekend business. And some of the challenges come from non-Jewish retailers, right? Who, who are saying, this is ridiculous, Sunday is becoming a day when many people are doing shopping and, and we need this day to be an open day. Um, but the other reason that by the mid 20th century there are more challenges to these laws is that the Supreme Court is increasingly moving toward a more strictly separationist application of the First Amendment and a willingness to interpret the 14th Amendment equal protection as applying to states. So there's a whole kind of legal discussion about to what extent the First Amendment rights necessarily apply to the states, even after the passage of the 14th Amendment. And by the middle of the 20th century, the Supreme Court is not only becoming more strictly separationist when it comes to church and state, but it's also kind of um, exercising a heavier hand when it comes to enforcing states on the grounds of the 14th Amendment. And so this leads to a new kind of energy among um, what one scholar calls the sort of lawyer leaders of American Jewish life, right? There are a lot of trained lawyers at this point who are American Jews who get very, very invested in the idea that constitutional law might be an answer to the Jewish question. Right? That if they can get the right interpretation, if they can get the courts just to understand really what the spirit of the Constitution is, then the kinds of exclusions from within citizenship, the kinds of exclusions that are affecting their effective citizenship will no longer be. Um, and so one of the kind of prime examples of the, a kind of lawyer leader who, who does this is, um, is a man named Leo Pfeffer who um, eventually writes this mighty tome, I mean, it's really thick, um, people don't write books like this so much anymore, called Church, State, and Freedom. Um, and he works for the American Jewish Congress. And this book continues to be republished and it's cited in legal cases. And it is seen as a kind of authority on church state issues. And he decides that these Sunday laws are a real problem. And he wants to find some test cases to try to prove that they are indeed unconstitutional. And the, the one that he finds um, is a 1948 case that involved some butchers from the Lower East Side and that had to do with that early 20th century law that I mentioned, right, that was clearly passed to curtail what um, you know, kosher butchers were able to do. And so this is this case that he says clearly shows that there is a grounded constitutional claim against Sunday laws because they show the government favoring one religion, establishing a kind of religion, right, and curtailing the freedom of others. It seems very straightforward to him. The courts will not give an inch. They are not interested in this line of thinking. Uh, the appeals are all denied. And he then tries to appeal this to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, this is 1948, refuses to hear the case for want of a substantial federal question. You see, there's nothing, these are these civil institutions, these laws, that, that rationale has been repeated over and over. The kind of Christian nature of them has just been incorporated in the secular, in the civic. It's just part of the neutral, it's part of the unmarked. There is no federal question, they say. But, Pfeffer is a pretty smart guy, and he realizes, and we see this happen in our own time, that sometimes a lawsuit is not so important for whatever the outcome is going to be. It's often important for the publicity. It's important for getting people to think about an issue. And that's exactly what happens when he, when he does this. 
because he's energizing now um, over a dozen Jewish organizations that write briefs in favor of these Lower East Side butchers and the American Civil Liberties Union that becomes interested in these cases. And so then that gets us back to Chernock and Crown Kosher Supermarket in Spring, on Sumner Avenue in Springfield. So in that case, um, the Supreme Court becomes actually convinced that in fact there is a federal question. But more than a federal question, there's also an effort, I think, to think about whether there's a Jewish question. So the case moves forward and uh, the state of Massachusetts says that it had the right to enforce these Sunday laws and um, that, that they are constitutional and it puts forward this argument, but it does a really bad job at the lower court level, at the district court level. Because what the state of Massachusetts should have said, what did I just tell you? There's a case that the Supreme Court wouldn't take, right? All the state of Massachusetts has to say, this is a few years later, is like, there is no federal, you can't say this is unconstitutional. We literally just saw the Supreme Court say, no, thank you. Nothing to see here. But the state of Massachusetts doesn't get its act together, right? And it seems that there's actually like some really negligent lawyering happening. And in fact, the Crown Supermarket prevails. And the district court says, yeah, this is pretty unconstitutional, right? This gives special protection to the dominant Christian sects. And so interesting also that it talks about those Christian sects and Orthodox and conservative Jews naming particular groups of Jews that are um, unfairly affected by this law, right? And, and when it's naming those Christian sects, it's talking about Seventh-day Adventists because that's another group that is oftentimes found um, you know, in violation of these laws and sometimes put forward some legal claims against them. So this is what the majority says. Well, the, there is a dissent and dissents are often very important, especially if a case is gonna go up. And the first thing the dissent actually says is like, get your act together, Massachusetts. You had something you should have said and you didn't say it. So they put that right in the, in the dissent. But there's also in the dissent, I think what can only be understood as a kind of anti-Semitic barb, right? And the dissent basically says that it is clear that the Jewish people, and then philo-Semitism, philo, how wonderful, wonderful, they're great, but they would not for one minute support any movement where under the cloak of uh, religion, a one-man corporation was using a spiritual garment as a medium by which unjustly to enrich himself. So they're basically claiming that this guy, Chernock, who's operating Crown, he just wants to make more money. And he wants to be open on Sunday because he knows that he could make more money that way because he'll be kind of the only game in town, right? So anyone needs something, they're gonna go to Crown Supermarket. Um, and so there's this kind of allegation of Jewish greed, of a kind of avaricious motivation. So, the state of Massachusetts decides to appeal to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court bundles this case with a couple of other Sunday law cases that have been sort of percolating at the lower level of the courts. And it comes before the Supreme Court in 1960. And this time the state of Massachusetts is better prepared. And the attorneys for the state of Massachusetts trot out the public welfare justification. And there's lots of good case law to say, this is settled, right? This is in the name of public welfare. We need to have a day of rest for workers, for families. It's good for Americans. And if Sunday turned out to be the best day for the most people, so be it. And they argue that, and this is very legal, if there is an indirect consequence and it ends up impinging on other people's religious observance, that is not something that's on the state to have to remedy. An indirect consequence you know, it, it could be I was just walking by, my backpack happened to hit something and that hit someone else, it's not my fault, right? So if it's an indirect consequence, we are not liable for any kinds of constitutional issues. And they also say that if these people, right, meaning the Jewish people who are, who are asserting these claims, want to close their stores on Saturday too, that's fine, right? That there's no, there's no kind of actual affirmative thing that the state is doing to these people. They're just saying Sunday's a day of rest. At the same time, and you know, you can listen to the oral arguments of these cases, and so it's just like fascinating to actually listen to these attorneys. And there's this one point in the oral argument 
where the justices start to question, like, well, what does Crown sell? And the attorneys have kind of led them that way, and they say, well, they sell, like, National Biscuit Company cookies, right? They sell all the, like, it's not just food that Jewish people need to eat. And there's kind of this, like, laughter in, in the courtroom that, you know, why, why is this store that's acting like it's just selling things for Jews selling things like cookies and things that just any normal person would eat? And none other than Justice Frankfurter, right, who's, who's a Jewish justice on the court, he asked, well, are they also selling telegraph paper? And the attorney says, yes, they are. And everybody's kind of laughing. And this is this very, like, funny moment about how absurd the kind of pretense of, of kashrut or of religious law is for really what everybody seems to be starting to understand is just this community wanting to make more money. And it doesn't help that Chernock like falls asleep during the hearing and he's eventually escorted out by the warden. Um, so there's this sort of sense that this is all pretext for kind of economic greed. Now the attorneys for Crown, and they, they are joined with a number of Jewish organizations that file amicus briefs and they say they're speaking on behalf of all Jews, that they believe this is unconstitutional, and they put forward the claim that this is a state establishment of religion, and that also this is a problem when it comes to religious freedom because there is an inherent value of pluralism. And they not only focus on the immutability of orthodoxy, right? So there's another interesting exchange where the justices are saying, well, if these guys were not orthodox, would this be a problem as much, right? So they're really saying this is this immutable religious tradition. And, and in fact, G Chief Justice Warren in some of the memos, the court memos, says, he writes, the Orthodox Jews are a real difficult claim here because we can't quite say that this is something they could change. Um, but the crescendo of the oral argument that Crown puts forward is that these few people, those few groups in our society who are attempting to, re to resist cultural engulfment, right? They don't want to be incorporated. They don't want to be overcome. They don't want to be engulfed. They should be permitted to do so. That a pluralistic society and cultural pluralism is an American value, right? Really trying hard to push against that overcoming logic of Christianity as the unmarked civil regulation. So what does Crown, uh, what does the Supreme Court end up doing? They end up siding with the state of Massachusetts. So they, in fact, overturn what the district court had decided, and they say, in fact, these laws are not unconstitutional. It's absolutely constitutional to have Sunday laws. But the court is stressed by this, and it's funny that a court that had said uh, a little over a decade earlier that there was no federal question then spends 200 pages in permutations of majority opinion and, and concurring opinion and dissenting opinion and another dissenting opinion trying to explain why these laws are constitutional. And Warren, who writes the majority opinion, he says the, religion, uh, the religious origins of the laws are merely a relic and that public welfare is at the heart, so these are a civil regulation. And because America is so diverse, the good of the many may sometimes have indirect consequences that harm the good of the few, but that's what it is to live in a diverse society. So he is essentially denuding Christianity under the rubric of talking about it only as a sort of relic of the origin and as a basis for the civil good. Um, in the dissenting, of, in one of the dissenting opinions, and, and there's more than one, um, Justice William Douglas, who, who authors it, writes, a legislature of, of Christians can no more make minorities conform to their weekly regime than a legislature of Muslims or Hindus. Any other reading imports, I fear, an element common in other societies, but foreign to us. And I would actually argue that both in the majority opinion and in the dissent, there is a kind of similar logic, actually, that religion, or specifically Christianity, is imagined, on one hand, as marginal to American law and civil structure. It just so happens it's the origin, right? It just so happens that it is what is at the bottom of it. And yet the irony was that this seeming diminishment of Christianity was actually bolstering its civic power. So whether deemed foreign to have religion at the kind of basis of American civic structure, and so the, his dissent is premised on the fact that in general, there isn't religion at the basis of American political or legal life, or 
named a relic, both of these opinions are sort of sidelining Christianity, trying to make it imaginable that it's not operating as this kind of force of the unmarked, of the neutral. And it makes it harder, in fact, I think, to make claims against the power of something when that thing is not claiming its power, right? Which I think is fascinating. Um, it's harder to see how it operated. This is part of the process of naturalizing and normalizing. And in defining what Jewish lawyers were certain was Christianity, right? They're so frustrated. And just saying, no, this is a, you're wrong. This is a civil regulation. It undermines the effort to use the discourse of religious freedom to protect Jewish civil standing. If the Sunday Sabbath is simply a civil regulation, then how did those who did not mark that Sabbath fit into the civic? It actually ends up saying something really more profound about who does not fit in, because it's not just saying you're not Christian. OK, they know that. It's saying you're not even part of the civic. And if this is not a way of thinking about the Jewish question, then I'm not sure what it is. I think the only way, in fact, we can really understand what's going here, going on here, is by thinking about it as actually asserting a kind of profound question about difference, about collectivity, and about Jews. So in other words, the civil religion of Judeo-Christian America persisted in marking Jews as different, as the exception that needed to be tolerated or overcome, and sometimes could not be. So I want to turn then to the second piece of tonight's talk and, um, and turn to whiteness. Within the realm I have America, uh, within the realm of effective citizenship, if one American discourse presumed to have solved the Jewish question was that of religious freedom, right? And I think that's absolutely one of the ways that people would assert there's no Jewish question in the United States. Uh, the other has surely been whiteness. Historians and social critics claim that American Jews became white in the decades after World War II, and that this, if, if, if it hadn't already been erased, then this absolutely erased the Jewish question, right? It's like the final you know, period on the end of the sentence that it has been answered, and that is it, that Jews are white. And whiteness, like Christianity, served in that same role as the unmarked, as the neutral. So the question is, how does the history of Jews, quote, becoming white change if we take seriously the possibility of a Jewish question? That whiteness, much like the idea of the Judeo-Christian, I would argue, emerges less as a resolution and more as a new articulation of America's Jewish question in the second half of the 20th century. So by the 1960s, I think we can think of whiteness working as a kind of decidedly liberal way to talk about the successes and failures of American liberalism. So there's a kind of reckoning, right? And the idea is that whiteness worked for those people designated as white who could become the unmarked individual liberal subjects of American citizenship and personhood. And yet it wasn't working, whiteness was not working for those designated as not white who needed to be given opportunities and tools to become unmarked in a sense to become white, right? And this is, is really the controlling logic of the idea of the civil rights movement. What are those protections that need to be given to those classes of people who are marked as not yet the neutral, not yet the unmarked citizens? And Jews enter the conversation about whiteness by self-consciously marking their own whiteness and showing a great deal of anxiety about its terms, about the terms of being incorporated under whiteness. And it's that kind of, those two pieces of both very self-consciously proclaiming to be on that side of this tension, but also feeling a fair amount of anxiety about what it means to mark themselves as white that I think is really interesting to trace um, and, and helps us sort of understand the ways in which the sort of overcoming or incorporating logic of whiteness was itself also a kind of language of coercion and of disciplining, and also inherently was unstable, right? So, so those are some of the things that we're gonna see. So in a really you know, well-known essay that Norman Potharitz, who became the editor of Commentary Magazine in 1960 and remained for 35 years in that position, he writes this essay in 1963 that probably some of you have heard of called My Negro Problem in Ours. And in it, he suggests that the Negro problem, his language, would never be resolved 
unless color does in fact disappear. And when he's talking about the Negro problem, I think we also should hear in our mind how he's talking about how he thinks the Jewish problem or the Jewish question has been resolved. He argues that for black Americans, the only way that they could become white was, quote, let the brutal word come out miscegenation, right? So not just cultural assimilation or incorporation, but by a biological process of full overcoming incorporation, colonizing, whatever word you want to use. He classifies himself at this time as a white liberal, and he says that he believes that color can disappear. He believes in the possibility of color blindness, and that white is the neutral. So when color disappears, all will be white. That is the neutral. That is the unmarked. And he argues that Jewishness is, to an extent, a manifestation right, that Jews have become white. And he, in fact, then this is where he gets a little confused and confusing. They have not had to do so via miscegenation. So this sort of helps him show, well, maybe it's a more natural or easy fit for Jews, that they can retain some element of distinctiveness and be white. But he's also putting forward the idea that ultimately the only way to be white is to be nothing else, right? So he's holding this kind of tension, even as he's kind of externalizing it as being really about the quote unquote Negro problem. And a kind of manifestation of the grappling that I think Jews are doing about whiteness in this period is the rising identification of black anti-Semitism, right? This becomes a discourse by the late 1960s that's used to describe what is understood to be the kind of remaining anti-Semitism that exists. And it's designated self-consciously as black anti-Semitism, a kind of self-conscious pronouncement of Jewish whiteness, since the energy of animus against Jews must come from outside of the identity category in which Jews are part of. So in 1968, the American Jewish Congress has a series of talks at the 92nd Street Y on, quote, Negro Jewish confrontation. And these are coming on the heels of uh, Ocean Hill Brownsville, which was a very tense time in public schools in Brooklyn when um, black communities were calling for more community control over schools, and many of the teachers and leaders of those schools were Jewish. And so that's sort of the context in which these conversations are held. And in them, so hundreds of people come to these talks, and there are Jewish leaders from the American Jewish Congress who are talking, and they invite some black leaders, and they're trying to sort of puzzle this through. And from the very beginning, the Jewish leaders are saying in a, in a self-conscious way that surely Jews are part of white America. So they say, if you don't understand that all of us white folk grew up with views of black folk, then you don't understand this Negro Jewish confrontation but they're also pivoting to a differentiation, saying things like the Jews did not hold Negroes in slavery, the Jews are not the white power establishment, right? So trying to kind of, again, much like Podhoretz, kind of play with the idea of like, just what is it to become the unmarked white, right? What does it mean to sort of fully assume this category? And clearly, I think in their mind is the essay that James Baldwin, the, the black thinker, uh, had written in, and, and, and fiction writer, novelist, had written in a 1967 New York Times essay where he asserts Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white, right? So if that's, if that's the category that has overcome and incorporated you, then yes, in fact, it's must be black anti-Semitism if, if we are incorporated into this category of white. Um, and, and, and so you see these kinds of rising discussions of black anti-Semitism also start to emerge by the 70s with discussions about quote unquote new anti-Semitism, right? Marking this idea that anti-Semitism can't possibly come from those places that had incorporated Jewishness, that had brought Jewishness in. And so it must be new, it must be something else, it must be from outside. Um, and the, the idea of new anti-Semitism bundles together black and third world or Muslim actors as, big, as the biggest threats. And this makes sense, of course, in a kind of worldview where Jews and non-Jews understood Jews as white and as the West and identified Israel in similar terms. So a manifestation of this is 
an article that um, Letty Cotton Pogrebin writes in Ms. Magazine in 1982 called Anti-Semitism in the Women's Movement. And she describes being attacked in feminist spaces for Zionism, which she equates with being Jewish. And I hope this reminds you, those of you who listened to Tuesday's lecture, of the fear that different Jewish organizations had in the 19th 40s, and then again even in the 1960s, that any statement of Jews as Jewish nationalists was going to sort of creep into a general statement that all Jews were Jewish nationalists, and that this would put Jewish citizenship in the United States in jeopardy. And she talks about how she began to wonder why the movement's healing embrace can encompass the black woman, the Chicana, the white ethnic woman, but the Jewish woman is not honored in her specificity. Um, and you know, whether or not she's historically accurate about that kind of embrace, we could talk about um, separately. But she is arguing that Jews' specificity can't be honored, is not being honored, because they are presumed to be white, right? And her description of new anti-Semitism, which is front and center in this article, is about a stabilized and settled whiteness as if it were a fact, a fact that had perhaps solved the Jewish question, even if it caused certain collateral damages or discomforts. And she and other Jews at the, the same time were not looking to unsettle whiteness as grounds of Jewish incorporation, and yet the grounds themselves were unsettled and unsettling. So for the last case I wanna talk about just for a couple minutes, um, I wanna talk about a case that happens just as this article comes out um, and this is a case from 1982 when a synagogue in Silver Springs, Maryland, Silver Spring, Maryland, was vandalized with anti-Semitic graffiti by eight reportedly white men who were convicted on criminal charges. But the synagogue leaders um, who are working with an executive director who's involved in this Jewish advocacy center start to think that maybe the criminal charges are not enough that maybe there need to be civil charges as well, right? Because unlike a criminal charge, a civil remedy could identify discrimination as a motive. So they're starting to grapple with whether sh they should look for this civil remedy. And some of the lawyers they're talking to, and this Jewish Advocacy Center is, is sort of like modeled on a kind of Southern Poverty Law Center or something like that, trying to kind of put together cases that will bolster discrimination law. And the lawyer suggests that there was this 1866 civil rights statute that was passed right before the, the um, civil rights amendments were passed. It anticipates the 14th Amendment by giving people of every race and color the same civic protections enjoyed by white people, right? So this is what the statute says. And that clause, enjoyed by white people, triggered the kind of anxious question in the case. If Jews were white, then could they find remedy under this statute? And before they even bring this claim, the, the members of the synagogue really are split on whether it's a good idea to bring this claim. And in fact, Jewish organizations start to weigh in, and they fear that filing the suit on these grounds would fuel a kind of putatively false impression that Jews were not white, right? Or synoptically that Jews were a race. And the synagogue decides only to move forward with this civil claim when the attorneys promise to make a kind of hybrid logic to the claim, which is that Jews are not a race, by which they mean that Jews were the unmarked, that they're white, but that in this case they had been perceived as one. So this is, this is the case that, this is the claim that they bring forward. The lower courts reject it, and they rule that because Jews are white, they can't gain the protection under the statute. As whites, they were already the neutral, unmarked subjects of liberal law, so they're not a protected class. The lower courts say, it's clear what this statute means, and, and if you're saying that Jews are white, which the attorneys say over and over, that Jews are white, they're just being perceived as not being white, then you can't make this claim. The Supreme Court, however, is willing to entertain the case because of the inconsistency at a lower court where this same statute is brought by an Arab American who's claiming in actually a tenure discrimination case that he had not been tenured because he was perceived to be not white and he uses the same 1866 statute and the court accepted it. So to try to resolve this tension, the Supreme Court says, okay, in fact, we will take these, this case. 
And Jewish anxiety grows as it goes up to the Supreme Court. Liberal Jewish organizations that so often would be right there entering these amicus briefs balk. They, they don't know what to do. They don't want, and this is written clearly in their correspondence, they don't want Jews to appear as alien or racially distinct. And they're nervous that if they use this statute and they make this claim, then that will be as the way that Jews appear. And the second, they argue that the law, the 1866 law, was intended only for black people, that race meant black. And therefore, Jews were not a race, right? They're neutral, they're, they're the unmarked. Eventually, the American Jewish Committee and the Anti-Defamation League do decide to join an am amicus brief. And they emphasize in it that Jews do not belong to distinct non-white races and argue that the end point of the remedy would be to return Jews to their rightful standing as white people. The ruling, it, which is unanimous, I'm always like, do you wanna guess what it is? Okay, so the ruling is unanimous and it's for the synagogue. And the justices, however, construct a different case. They construct the case that they wanna rule on, which is an originalist case. And they say, yes, Jews are white today, but they have standing to, to, to be given remedy under this statute because in the past, when the statute actually went on the books, they would have been perceived as a race. And what's interesting is in, in judging on this case and ruling the case, they can consign Jews to a retrograde status that reflected a time when it was more plainly understood that they were not the neutral subjects of liberal law, right? So they actually point out exactly the dynamic of what this incorporation or overcoming of Jewishness through whiteness looked like. And we might think um, together about how or whether this bears out an observation that James Baldwin again makes uh, this time in 1985, that it is probably, um, it is probable I have it written wrong here, right on the slide, good. It is probable that it is the Jewish community that in America has paid the highest and most extraordinary price for becoming white. And I think what he is thinking about is what it means to have become overcome in this seemingly neutral, unmarked language that is constantly unsettling because of the sense that if, if there is a way in which Jews um, push up against or press up against those ideas of the neutral, then they can be excluded from that language. So in motion, we can see that whiteness was no more settled or stable than Judeo-Christian or than citizenship, right? That even if historically each had provided Jews with myriad material benefits, Jewish belief in it did not settle it, but it empowered it. And whiteness has clearly done a great deal to overcome or tolerate Jewishness, but because whiteness has been unsettled constantly, it's a shifting logic of power, it never settled the question. Rather, whiteness embedded the question of Jews' categorical nature, their lurking difference from the unmarked in its own logic. So to conclude, and because I have a red-eye flight, I have to catch home tonight, um, or else we could talk for a long time. Um, I want to make just a few suggestions about what I think America's Jewish question, question can do for the field and for our present. So I told you that in 2016, uh, really this is when my obsession with the idea of a Jewish question began, right, with, with the election of Trump. And the six years since have only, only made it harder and harder for me to release the question of America's Jewish question from my imagination, now marked with synagogue shootings and white nationalist marches and insurrectionist attempts to take over the US Capitol. But I want to offer a kind of constructive conclusion to ask what can America's Jewish question teach us? So one fundamental thing I wanna suggest is I think it can allow my field, American Jewish history, to write and think Jews more deeply and more honestly into American history. The orthodoxy of insisting on its absence has effectively taken American Jewish history out of US history by exceptionalizing Jews into a kind of oblivion. Um, the, the idea of America's Jewish question allows us instead to see relationality, to see contingency and conditionality that shape Jews' interaction with core American legal, political, um, and other structures and 
In other words, while the eschewal of the Jewish question has really written Jews out of American history, I'm hopeful that a full-throated analysis of it can write them into American history. Second, I think it can help us think about how to globalize US and Jewish and European history. The binary between American Jewish history and modern Jewish history, which has long been presumed to be simply European Jewish history, has perpetuated a kind of false framing. That emancipation is an either or, and it's defined by the United States where it worked and Europe where it didn't work. To entertain America's Jewish question is to dissolve the binary and its totalizing nature, and in a sense, to provincialize Europe and the United States and to disrupt categories. For example, perhaps it could give us new ways to see and write about Jews in the United States who have long been marginalized from the American Jewish experience. So maybe non-European Jews, right? This opens up the possibility to do that and to think differently about what it means for emancipation to work and not work and for whom. And finally, I think America's Jewish question as a framework can extend, in a sense, Jewish history beyond the Jewish subject. In other words, the Jewish question was as much about Jews as it was about the paradox of the collective in modern liberal political experiments. And the Jewish question simultaneously carved out Jews as liberalism's exception, while it also marked them often as no different from other categories of people who pose similar interrogatives to the liberal order. So when we can recognize this, that the Jewish question could both be about Jews and could be a discourse beyond Jews, we allow for broader interpretive and analytical range for Jewish history. And finally, if you hear in this plea a kind of call for something beyond the scholarly, you are correct about that as well. My hope is that by introducing a kind of curiosity about the Jewish question as opposed to a certainty about its resolution or non-existence, my hope is that we who live in this world today can unloose ourselves from narrow and what I feel are sometimes suffocating terms of current day discussions about inequality and injustice, including ones about anti-Semitism, and that we'll think more precisely and productively about the broad structures of American life that have fueled systems of inequality in which Jews exist. We'll think about the prerequisites and conditions of citizenship not citizenship as simply the answer to, Ameri to the Jewish question. We'll think about the exclusions and inclusions of effective citizenship. And we'll be able to regard anti-Semitism and the complications of Jewish life today as part of, not apart from, those structures that have fueled liberalism, perhaps despite itself. So then when we seek ways to make improvement, to find justice, to find security, we'll look toward those structures as well as ripe for reform, that citizenship is ripe for reform, that these modes of ineffective citizenship that so many people struggle under are ripe for reform and remaking and re-envisioning. So I hope we can proceed with sight and not with willed blindness, with an appetite for questions and not the false fullness of a question unasked, but somehow already answered. Thank you. Lila, thank you. That was fascinating. I don't know if I need a mic. Do I need my name? I think it would be a good idea to use a handheld mic. OK, where is that? Okay, I'm gonna just, I don't know how much time we have for questions. Can someone hit me over the head and? I gotta leave at 8.28, so we have nine minutes. Okay, so, so, so really, so <laughs> unless, unless someone has pull with American I Airlines. I the first question. So for me, what, what, what is missing is something that you do really well, which is to contextualize. So I'm wondering if you could say something about how the Holocaust is an event, and the last word you used was oblivion, right? Is erasure. Or, so what does the Holocaust do to this, to the struggle over inclusion? Sure, right. Yeah. So, you know, part of the way that the historiography, I think, has been so directed to this idea, oh, I think I have to repeat your question. Okay, so the question that Susan asked, 
is how the Holocaust kind of looms over all of this as a context. So the, the way in which there was the assumption that the Jewish question simply didn't exist in the United States is tethered to you know, the historiography, the historians who are primarily writing after World War II. I mean, there are already people before World War II who are saying there's no Jewish question in the United States. After World War II, it becomes anathema to say that that's possible, right? And I think that part of kind of dealing with the trauma of the Holocaust is in part leaning into the sense of liberalism working in the United States, right? And I think it does affect the kind of willingness to be embraced or, or the language I've been using is overcome by the ideas of the Judeo-Christian and by the ideas of whiteness. Um, and I think it's impossible to understand the sort of vigor of, of that um, desire without thinking about the Holocaust. Okay, thank you. So um, one of the audience members asked, why do you think historians like Jonathan Sarna uh, reify the exceptionalist narrative? So Sarna is, is not alone in really believing in the exceptionalist narrative. Um, in fact, I think that is definitive, it's defining of really, you know, more than one generation of American Jewish history. Um, and I think actually connected to the question you just asked about the Holocaust and its importance in terms of a tether of the kind of issue of a Jewish question, I think that the field of American Jewish history really came out of that same environment, right? So some of the same motivations and desires are undergirding how the field of American Jewish history has, has been defined. And I think that there is a kind of certainty in, in the ideas of American liberalism that have really grounded much of the field. But I also want to acknowledge that there are historians who are starting to ask very different questions because the field of American history has so clearly problematized the ideas of American exceptionalism. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of build on that and take it in a different direction. Do you think that the Holocaust is a historical crisis? It creates room for difference. Is there any way in which there's this paradoxical situation going on? On the one hand, there's this desire to erase difference. I'm talking about in the Jewish community, and particularly among Jewish lawyers who were using the First Amendment um, uh, to try to open up the concepts of who is who is in and who is outside the circle of we. Mm -hmm. But is the Holocaust also kind of create this inward looking um, uh, desire to have it okay to be marked? You see what I'm saying? So there's the, on the one hand, the desire to kind of take away difference right. as a category. Yeah, I see. Yeah, so the question is like, does the Holocaust um, the, at the same time sort of um, you know, have this kind of universalizing, there's no difference, but also this sort of particularizing, right? Yeah, I, I think it absolutely does. I mean, and those are actually sort of the existential debates about even the meaning to be drawn from the Holocaust, right? Like to what extent is it a universal thing and to what extent, it, you know, must it be sort of understood as a very, very particularistic thing? Um, you know, and I think that that, that tension is clear in, you know, if this were really just a story of these frameworks of, of Judeo-Christian or of whiteness simply in, incorporating Jews, um, none of this tension would be alive, right? But there's so much tension in this and in what, you know, what is surrendered and given up and what might be the false promises of assuming that Jews or even other collectives can just kind of enter into that unmarked category. Right. 
this is about not being full, like full personhood, right? This ruling or potential ruling is raising the question of whether women as a category are full Excellent. persons. So I guess these are two linked things coming out of this recent news. Absolutely. So the question is about how to integrate thinking about Roe v. Wade and the idea of whether overturning it may be an infringement of certain groups' religious freedom, and also to think about women and their effective or ineffective citizenship in light of the possibility of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Um, and, you know, I think that the, the language of religious freedom in this country is so vexed because it's predicated on having to define what religion is, right? And, and, you know, what is, even if we saw this in cases about COVID vaccine, right, and who had a legitimate, um, you know, authentic and significant religious belief that could allow them to be exempt from vaccination mandates or whatever it might be. And, you know, the, the idea of how to define what religion is and what it means to not establish religion and to offer religion, religious freedom is, is a kind of impossible idea. Right. And it's only possible in a sense. And this is why I think like it's just so clear that the founders were not thinking about just not having religion involved in the civic. It's only possible when it's tethered or indexed by the thing which is imagined to be definitive of what religion is. Right. And so, you know, I think that that's this, this major problematic of any case that is, is being designated through a, a kind of, um, you know, grounding in ideas of religious freedom. And, you know, certainly I think the idea of, of Roe v. Wade being overturned and what that means about women's effective citizenship is yet another indication that any kind of understanding of emancipation or citizenship as a settled matter, right, as something that is linear and it is achieved and then it's checked off and it's done, which again has been kind of the understanding of why there is no Jewish question in America, it's, it's a completely absurd, you know, it, it's, it's not only quixotic, but it's, it's completely um, um, ignorant of how historical change unsettles citizenship in so many different ways, right? And, and there can be thresholds that move, that expand, that contract, and, you know, clearly we're, we're in a moment where we may see a, a real contraction of it. I, I think we need to let our guests uh, get to the airport. So thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>